same load as a forward air controller. Mm -hmm. He was a mechanic on the tanks. Hmm. Well, we, we try to get as many as we can. Well, I know. It seems though the information is available to you. No, not the personal stories. Well, I, yeah. I that, that's what makes the history, you know, the individual's experiences. Um, that's what makes it real. You know, you can read a book and talk about the tactics. Well, when I was over at the Tibbetts Cadets there, over in Lansenburg, those guys were kind of arguing with each other. You know, it, it didn't impress me very much. Well. And it's not their fault. Every person experiences their experiences right. on a small scale. Absolutely. And every time you get a group together, one will say, well, no, it wasn't like that. I was on the other side of the hill, and this is what happened. Mm -hmm. you know? And they're not wrong. Right. They're right. Well, that's why you need all the different perspectives. Yeah. Well, I hope it gets what you need, but, you know, mostly what I'm talking about is uh, you can't say it's just a 366 spider group. It's my own experience. Absolutely. And as I went through them in my lifetime, it's uh, not always as interesting as people might want to think. They always want to get some kind of a big story and they want to push up. No, that, we, we want as complete a story as we can. Uh, sometimes it's Impressive. Other times it can be very mundane, but that's all part of the story. Should I take the the records that I got there and just to kind of leave? No, through, no, no. You know, just well, just uh, put some automation to it instead of just sitting here. Well, but I think we can get you to where we want you to go. Well, that, that's what I querying you about where right. you want me to go. Well then, th this will unfold. <laughs> He's chuckling over there. This, this will unfold. First <laughs> I have to make a marking statement telling who everybody is. Mm -hmm. uh, today is um, Seventh. February 7th, 2002. We're interviewing uh, Mr. Lawrence Charbonneau at the uh, Saratoga Armory. Um, Mr. Charbonneau, where were you born? I was born in Cohoes, New York. You grew up in Cohoes? Yes, I went to Cohoes High School. There's a Colonel Dick Calkins that you know from the Tibbetts Cadets. Mm -hmm. He and I were classmates okay. in the Cohoes High School. What was Cohoes like back uh, in that period? There's a new book written on what Cohoes was like in those days. It's in the Cohoes Library. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, town main occupations were the woolen mills. Mm -hmm. If the woolen mills faded, the town disappeared. Mm -hmm. But the woolen mills stayed on for my grandfather's lifetime. He came from Canada. And uh, other than that, there were no other industries in the town. When did uh, when did you graduate from high school? They, we celebrated our 60th high school reunion at Lanciers Grove last year. And that, you're talking 1940 time period. Mm -hmm. Because in 41, in December, was when I entered the service right after Pearl Harbor. As many, many did. Right. What, do you remember where you were when uh, Pearl Harbor? Uh, yes, was? I was standing in front of an old Philco radio, which was on top of a, a little library section of China closet. Mm -hmm. And the hammer just came right down on my life, right there. <laughs> Did you know that at the time? Well, not really. When you're 19, 20 years old, those things are just are piecemeal until they add up to a story of your life. What did you plan to do at that point? I was uh, working for the McCurry Machine Works. They had a patent on a uh, machine that thinned down goatskin hides mm -hmm. to make gloves for the Gloversville Mills up mm -hmm. here. And they had that machine 
I was an apprentice at the time, of course. They had that machine all over the world because it could thin down mm -hmm. and make it same thickness to make it like a piece of material rather than blob and piece of hair. Here. Mm -hmm. Ladies gloves is what they were fashioning with that mm -hmm. machine out of the product. When um, just after Pearl Harbor occurred, uh, what did you and your friends think about uh, what was coming? Or you didn't really give it a, much of a thought at that point? Well, uh, I never thought I'd be in Europe. I thought I'd be in Japan because the Japanese were the ones that stepped in and right. cut the history of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Other than that, all we knew it was just a big mess. We were in for the duration plus. It wasn't a 60-day uh, trip to some place. Now you enlisted? Yeah. Uh, Army Air Corps. Why did you choose the Army Air Corps? <laughs> a friend of mine had that question asked of him when he got to the desk where two or three uh, people were signing people up. And he says, uh, I don't want to join the Navy, talking to the Navy man, the recruiter. The guy says, well, why, did, why, doesn't he, why don't you want to go in the Navy? He says, well, I haven't got anything against him now, and I don't want to have <laughs> it. It was just a, a shake of the dice, but at the time, I was interested as a machinist. And I, was riding Harley motorcycles at the time, and I uh, knew air uh, cooled engines. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd go into the Army Air Corps and become a mechanic, which I did. Mm -hmm. I was a mechanic before I was a pilot. Mm -hmm. Where'd you take your basic? Basic was at uh, Fort Dix. What was that like? Was this your first time away from home? Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody along that time period, it was their first time away from home. Yeah, it was Fort Dix, New Jersey, and then we went to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And from there, they separated us out into career fields, and I went to Aviation Mechanics Group. Went to Victorville, California. So was the basic okay for you? Just something Basic, be yeah. Actually, it was <clears throat> just getting used to hitting uh, appointments on time, no excuses, trying to learn how to wear the uniform and find out what the designated pennants were on the company uh, flagpole which told you what uniform you had to put on before you came out of the barracks. <laughs> so you were, that was your first learning experience. Uh -huh, uh -huh. There was not, not very much uh, in a spectacular sense of basic. Uh -huh. But uh, I was glad in later years that I did go the aviation mechanic route because I became for the 366 fighter uh, Group, I became the test pilot for all of the airplanes that were fixed mm -hmm. before they would put them back online. But I knew what uh, the engines could do, and I mm -hmm. knew what to write up so that the crew chief could evaluate it and fix it. How was the uh, how was the training? Which part? the aviation mechanics. It, you became an apprentice to very experienced people. Mm -hmm. And we're, uh, at the time, we're uh, crewing AT-9, which is a twin engine trainer at Victorville, California. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where I had three crews and uh, we would change engines at night. And I asked for the night duty because it was cooler at night. And Every month, uh, my crews got an extra three-day pass to go into San Bernardino because of the uh, write-ups that we got and mm -hmm. the corrections that were made. And probably, if you want to think about it, 
for the accidents that were prevented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's as good as it amounted to. So you had good crews? Oh, yeah. Well, they're, they all started as trainees, just like I did. Mm -hmm. But uh, during the summer of, uh, let's see, 42, they were short of pilots at the time. And as a, I had been a crew chief on 189's twin engines, mm -hmm. every once in a while the instructors would let us take over control. We'd go up, you know, but once landing and takeoff is your problem. Flying the airplane is just a matter of getting used to pressures and so mm -hmm. on. But uh, they were short of pilots at the time in the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Air Force then, it was Air Corps. And they had a cadet examination. There were uh, Another lad by the name of Allen, he's a redhead, and I were the only two that passed the, the tests that they required to start you into the cadet program. Mm -hmm. From there we went to Nashville, Tennessee, and at Nashville they separated by testing coordination, uh, visual acuity, mm -hmm. uh, different things of that nature. They tested which ones would go on to pilot train, bombardier, or navigators. And uh, I wound up in the pilot career. Pretty rigorous training? At that time, it was not much different than you were experiencing in your basic. But uh, the training started after that. It was at Maxwell Field in Alabama. At Montgomery. What was Alabama like? At the time, it was pretty segregated. What did you think of that? Didn't think much of it. In later years, I thought less of it because we had people in the service from those areas and they were doing the same job that we were, but not getting any credit. You know the story of the Red Tails? Mm -hmm. We interviewed the uh, Colonel Dart from Saratoga. Yeah. He flew for them. Well, you know the story there. They did as good a job as any one of us did. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you, you took your flight training? I took my flight training. I went to uh, Arcadia, Florida. It was a training command for the southeast, it was uh, Arcadia, Florida. Then I went to Macon, Georgia for basic, and Mariana, Florida for advanced training. We also, while we were at Mariana, we took actual gunnery uh, right at Eglin Field, mm -hmm. Eglin 9 it was. Did and you know you are going to fighters at this point? That was the advanced trainer. Okay. There was no switching your career field at that time unless somebody decided she couldn't fly fighters. Okay. And then they would switch into some other career field. There was about a third in each primary, basic, and advance of the people that started each one of those training aspects mm -hmm. that made it. Two thirds went up. The one third made it, and two thirds were wiped out. And they became your uh, navigators and bombardiers. Mm -hmm. Was um, training dangerous? <laughs> Flying is dangerous. The uh, biggest problem was probably our inexperience mm -hmm. at the time. The problems that evolved, uh, people I'll give you, a, 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 for instance, in an AT-6, which is called a Texan, Navy calls it the SNJ, mm -hmm. they had a, a horn right behind your head that when you pulled back on your throttle and you didn't have your wheels down, it blew. <laughs> you know, wake up, <laughs> your wheels were down. Some of the people that were uh, flying 
were inexperienced and they didn't have the capability to go with the flow, as you might say. And uh, they would land with that horn blowing, throttle back, and belly in on a runway, and people would ask him, well, didn't you hear the horn? I couldn't shut it off. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, those are the things that cause the dangers you find. We, uh, probably the most dangerous thing was uh, uh, formation flying mm -hmm. and night flying. One of the things that probably, well, you may never have experienced, maybe you have, but one of the things that in advanced training, the instructors pull a switch on us of our grease pencils. You'd say, well, now what, what could that do? Well, you made your flight plan for a little short cross country, mm -hmm. and uh, you run it out with a grease pencil they gave you. It was red. When you got it under your uh, fluorescent lighting in the cockpit, all those lines disappeared. You know, it's just to show you, simple little things can cause the most mm -hmm. disastrous results. Hmm. And these are things that were uh, done for our benefit for later on. You wouldn't make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. Most of the flight instructors were came from where? right out of the cadet training program or back from uh, training with fighter units in Panama and Alaska. <coughs> they were, uh, most of them were second and first lieutenants. They had come through the program themselves, but they were the top notch right. of the trainees, if you want to put it that way. But nobody at that point had really had any combat experience. No. So after your uh, advanced training, uh, where'd you go? We started the 366. I say we. Colonel Dykemeyer started the 366 at Richmond, Virginia. We originally started at Bluthenthal Field, which is no longer. It's I think it's some commercial field. Yeah, the runways are still there. Now, but we gathered there and they issued us uh, clothing, tents, uh, parachute bags, and mm -hmm. this type of thing. We rounded up together at Richmond, Virginia, and that's where we took our uh, first operational training. What were you flying at that time? P-47s. What was that like? Huh? It's all in that book right there. Well, what were you, for your experience? Oh, my experience. Now you've gone from a trainer into a P-47. Yeah, 2,000 horsepower engine. Well, like a sports car all of a sudden. It was seven ton sports car. It wasn't really a sports car. But uh, your first flights in a P-47, that's what you had aspired to all through your training to go into a, a, a fighter aircraft. But at the time, the P-40s were the aircraft of the day. That was a hot airplane of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, with your first experience on a 2,000 horsepower, engine versus a 500 horsepower was tremendous. Mm -hmm. it, ha it flew you. You just had taken the instructions and told the reactions that you were supposed to have, what was going to have it feel like when you pushed 2,000 horsepower on and you're headed down the runway. A little road that goes no place, they call it. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, it was just a gradual learning experience, and that's what the operational training was for. Colonel Dyke Meyer was a, an old, old airmail pilot mm. out of Texas. Yeah. How did it handle? Very responsive to control. 
there was only one trouble that you could really get into. You had a, a selector valve for internal uh, fuel tanks, and one of those fuel tanks was behind the pilot seat, and the other was in the wing section. And if you took off, you had to go take off on internal wing fuel so that your CG, the center of gravity, wouldn't uh, get out of whack. Mm -hmm. Some people would get all uh, frustrated and they'd take off with using fuel out of that back tank. Mm -hmm. And we burned uh, on uh, combat type demands for the engine. We burned 100 gallons an hour. Mm -hmm. So if you were up and you forgot to, 100 gallons of fuel times eight pounds per gallon, seven pounds water is eight. Mm -hmm. Your center of gravity was all out of whack. And if you went and tried to do your Shandells and Immelmans and things that you were supposed to practice, you could get a tumble. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have enough altitude, you'd walk the farm. Mm -hmm. That's all it was doing. But other than that, that airplane flew like a dream. I'm here. So you like the P-47? Yes, sir. It also had behind the pilot, it had uh, first airplanes with armor in them behind the pilot. Mm -hmm. And that protected you from uh, aerial attack. But as cute as it might sound, we had the armor behind us and we needed it <laughs> under us because we were fighting with the, the uh, infantry and the tank units mm -hmm. constantly. That was our mission. They switched us when we were in England. They switched us from escort type missions with B-17s. We only flew about 16, 17 missions of escort. But at that time, the 8th Air Force, their mission was to fight the air war. Mm -hmm. And we were just along to get experience. And they had probably knocked down 80% of the capabilities of the German Air Force and the 8th Air Force. Mm -hmm. Colonel Gabreski just died a short while back. And as the P-51 came along at that time, it had 10 hours of fuel range. We had five. So we could go out to our fuel range, escorting them, but we had a secondary mission. We'd have 500-pound bombs or 1,000-pound bombs under each wind shackle. After we left them, we had a quick mission of strafing and dive bombing and head back to England. We always had two missions. Oh. And uh, the, well, I, I'm getting at the 8th Air Force now. I was in the ninth. Now, you went over to England when, approximately? December 1943. I graduated out of flying school in July of 43. So mm -hmm. between July and December, that was our operational training. Okay. So that's where you got your practice and some experience. Aerial gunnery. Mert Beach today is a bunch of Ferris wheels and a fun place with uh, golf courses all around. That was our ground target. <laughs> We were firing out to sea, but it was live ammunition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would fly from Ludenthal Field. We would fly with the P-47s down to the Gulf. And the Gulf was a complete firing range at that time. Mm -hmm. We used live ammunition with a tow target. The ammunition we had had the colored tips on it, different paints. And as it hit the screen target that was being towed, it was vertical at the time. The hits were registered by the color of the ammunition that they put in your airplane at that time. Okay. They scored you that. Okay. So in December 43, you shipped out? We shipped out from Camp Miles Standish over in Boston. Went over by boat? 
I've been across two oceans by boat. <laughs> yes, we went across. We landed in Glasgow, Scotland. And, uh, Did you come over on the Queen Mary? No. Mm -hmm. Some little liberty ship. Oh, okay. But we were in a convoy. We didn't go over as a separate vessel. Okay. We were in a convoy, and we had the uh, full unit went over as a unit. Oh. And when we landed in Glasgow, we put us, they put us on the train, and we went to Thruxton, England. Mm -hmm. Membury first, but that was only a few weeks. But Thruxton is where we gathered our airplanes, and being a test pilot for the 366, I had to take six, seven, eight pilots, and we'd go up to Glasgow, and we were picking up P-47s that came into there on deck storage. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any tail and didn't have any prop. They put them together in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So we tested them out before we brought them down to Thruxton. And they put them on the flight line and it's combat ready. That could be fairly dangerous. Now, remember my statement, flying is dangerous. That's true. Um, what did you think of England? What were your first impressions? Thruxton is just about 25 miles west of London. My first impression of England was Ju-88 bombing us at night, mm. going down into the, any one of the dugouts that they had there, and we really had a problem there because all of England, uh, the airfields and so on, were all camouflaged. Mm -hmm. And when you go up to orient you, they bring you up in a old goonie bird. You know, they take 20, 25 pilots, the sickest bunch of people you ever saw in your life, when they get out of that old goonie bird. They bring us around and show us what the fields looked like. It, it blended in, you know. Mm -hmm. There was a field that was green, the paint went across the runway. Mm -hmm. Camouflage is mm -hmm. the term. The uh, fighter pilots that were there, they didn't want to get in another Goonie Bird <laughs> as long as they lived, but they did many times. <laughs> now, what was the Goonie Bird? DC-3. Okay. Just like the Mohawk Airlines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was instructor pilot when I came back in. Mm -hmm. uh, because I went through instrument instructor school at Merced, California. But <laughs> that's jumping ahead right. a little bit. So they didn't like the Goonie Birds? No, but that was uh, an orientation mm -hmm. for those pilots to see what camouflage could really do to change the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, we experienced in our first weeks of flying in England the, the fog, the London fog. We didn't have any runway lighting at the time, so they took. 55-gallon drums of sand, mm -hmm. about half full of sand, and they put a couple of gallons of gasoline in it. And when we were coming in, talking to the tower, we could get a DF fix. They had a DF direction finding at the time. And we'd come back through dodging the barrage balloons whenever we were flying low enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd light those drums, and that was on one side of the runway. On the left side, because that's what the pilot has looks out the left side all the time for landing. Mm -hmm. With those drums, you'd line up and you use your instruments, your altimeter, you knew what the field uh, altitude was of the runway, and you'd come in and land. But uh, you have to remember that in those years, we weren't landing one airplane at a time because you'd have 75 airplanes up mm -hmm. in one fighter group. So if you landed, you'd do the math. If you landed and took five minutes for each one, the last guy was out of fuel before he could get in because he was coming back off a mission mm -hmm. a little bit later on. But in the training, uh, we landed three at a time. The flight leader, and the two elements mm -hmm. just landed. And they were landing probably 
one minute intervals. But still, it took a lot of time. So everybody had to be real careful. You came on a downwind leg at a thousand feet above the runway altitude. You made a, a chandelle up to the left. Put your wheels down while you're in a chandelle. And when you lined up, you were down to about 300 feet. Just a great big chandelle. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you landed. But your element uh, men that were on each side of you followed the leader. And they didn't watch the, the ground at all till they got into the landing position. They flew on him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where our, our formation flying uh, paid off, mm -hmm. the training that we had. Now, your first uh, combat missions were escorts? Our first combat missions, I got a list of them in my book there. They were uh, fighter sweeps and escorts. Okay. What was a fighter sweep like? Locating where the Germans were in Normandy, Dunkirk, mm -hmm. where the activity, German activity mm -hmm. was, the military equipment, they couldn't camouflage the fight at all. Oh, boy. They couldn't uh, hide at all. Right. A lot of it was on the roads because they had occupied those countries. France was theirs. Mm -hmm. Poland was theirs. Czechoslovakia was theirs. They were pretty cocky at that time. So we'd uh, go in probably at 30, 35,000 feet. You're talking now in terms of people flying normally on the airlines at 1,500 feet. Huh. 2,000 feet at most. We were flying at those altitudes without pressurized suits or anything else. We just had oxygen masks. We'd go in and locate uh, where the locomotives were, maybe near a roundhouse. Uh -huh. And it, it would give the people in the intelligence uh, possible targets. Okay. So you're, on fo you're photographing or no, just all visual? Vision. Okay. He had had a debriefing after each mission. Okay. Did uh, mm -hmm. you run into the Luftwaffe very often? The 8th Air Force was taken care of them okay. before. With 20% capability, they didn't bother yeah. us out over the channel or just over France. They were defending at that time Germany. Mm -hmm. and that's their fuel range then worked against them too, because they couldn't come over and start attacking somebody over the channel right. and let the bombers get through and bomb big cities in Germany. It's a cat and mouse game. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of what you're doing at this point really is in preparation for D-Day. Yes, while, while we're doing these type of missions, our mission was designated as dive bombing. That's what the P-47 did, mm -hmm. the Thunderbolt. We got so that by the training that we had, put a 500-pound bomb on the belly shackle using the, the reticle in our gun sight. There was a coordination between the two. We just roll over and we could hit a tank, a single tank. Mm -hmm. But you were exposing yourself always to ground fire mm -hmm. and ACAC at the time. And you know, if there was something that German had that they didn't want you to hit, they had plenty of ACAC around there. Mm -hmm. We were lucky in one way, towards the end of the time, the Battle of France, we had. <coughs> gotten so much of their tank business. I've got records of it there in the write-ups on it in my book. Mm -hmm. They finally got down to where they were using horses mm. for 88 gun. And that 88 gun was the best piece of equipment they had for anti-aircraft as well as anti-tank. Mm -hmm. I, I know what this anti-tank business is with the 88 because General Quesada came into the 366 at strip A1 
and he saw our flight commander, or group commander, Colonel John H. Pease, mm -hmm. Colorado. He's still alive. He says, get one of your pilots, and he says, I want to give him an aircraft radio, and I want to have him put in one of Patton's tanks. You know, simple mm -hmm. little instruction. So, <laughs> I was designated. They gave me a Jeep, an aircraft radio, and this is right after the bombings of the Battle of St. Lo. Go find General Patton. <laughs> Actually, it sounds strange, but a Jeep was probably one of the safest vehicles uh, behind the beachheads because the Germans would not divulge their position to fire at a Jeep. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what you, you had or what you were doing. But there were times when I had to go in bomb craters with the Jeep and four-wheel drive, go down to the bottom and let the battle go on this way, get to a crossroads, check with the MP, where's uh, General Pat? Well, they went that way yesterday. They hit another crossroads. They went that way yesterday. You know, we finally caught up with them. I've got a, a picture in my book. I keep referring to that because that's the story of my life. They, uh, we finally caught up with it, General Patton and 3rd Armored Division. My tank was called Mickey Mouse. <laughs> it was written on the side, you know, they had names mm -hmm. designated. And uh, the radio man that I had was also my Jeep driver. And I was the forward air controller at the time because by that time I had probably and I was uh, conversant with all the, the codes and the parlance, you know, with the fighters. And from there, all the way through south of St. Lo, all the way through to Paris, I was in the forward controller business, hmm. either in a tank or back at the fighter out there at the 366. I went back and flew more missions. We were at Drew, Leon, Reims, Ash, Belgium, all the way through. And, uh, and so your job was to... Forward air controller, he picks out a word as a camouflage... Excuse me, we're going to change the tapes. Okay. So the forward air, air observer, his job was to... He was with his head out of the tank <laughs> with a microphone setting up. We could call P-47. They were flying top cover over the beachhead. The beachhead weren't, but about, you know, 40 miles. Mm -hmm. Either way was ours, and that's all we had. So you worked directly with the directly with fighter our, cover? Directly with our uh, squadrons. No. I knew the capabilities of the individual pilots, and if I had an 88 millimeter gun shooting up a tank, Sherman tanks, mm -hmm. the 88 could go right through one side, but it wouldn't go out the other side. It'd ricochet around inside of it, mm -hmm. just chop it up. Now, was this a fairly new concept? No. Yeah, at that well, time it was. The, the, right, right. It was brand new. So, General Quesada evolved that. Okay. Concept. So you're one of the first yeah. forward air. Observing. Yes. And as uh, it wasn't just an observer, they called it a controller, okay. over air controller, because you had direct contact, contact by radio to the fighters. The tanks had no capability to communicate to the, the different frequencies. No frequencies. No frequencies. Different type of radio. Uh -huh. Ours was VHF radio, and they had just regular. Mm -hmm. AM, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they... Even uh, infantry had no way of talking to the man in the tank mm -hmm. until a little bit later on, they put an outlet on the tank and the, uh, the moon leaders would have 
a again that they could talk to the man in the tank without him having to open up. Mm -hmm. What were uh, what were some of the problems initially in um, working out this coordination between the air and the ground? The coordination that was required on our part with the tank units, the general path. The pilots had to know where the front lines were each day. Okay. On the control, uh, the fighter controller's tank, they had a cerise panel, big red type panel. It was a brilliant type mm -hmm. over the back. And when we called in our P-47, I would tell them, I've got a, a red panel today, or we change panels sometimes because the Germans tried to do the same thing mm -hmm. and they found what we were doing. And by doing that, when they went back to their debriefing, they gave the intelligence officer the coordinates of where the front lines were because with General Patton, they were different every day. Mm -hmm. They were different, and it was all equal to the fuel range that the tanks had. Mm -hmm. The uh, 25 miles or so was all a tank and go in a day, even with good roads. Mm -hmm. The fuel was a 500 horsepower radial engine, just like an aircraft engine. That's uh, when they uh, started uh, moving that fast, fuel was the criteria that was top-notch requirement. Mm -hmm. They put in a, a pipeline under the channel to Sherbert, and they had the Red Bull Highway. Mm -hmm. They put it all in five-gallon cans, and they tried to catch up to us every day. We couldn't move. We, we'd go right to the dregs of the fuel, circle like the old Indian game, mm -hmm. circle in a field, and uh, wait for the Red Ball Highway trucks to catch up to it. Let's, uh, let's step back a little bit. Uh, let's get into D-Day. We're, um, let's see, you're Strip A-1. Um, <clears throat> were you at D-Day on... Uh, I flew three missions at D-Day. What were those missions? One of them is tied into Mayor Jones of Saratoga Air. Oh. He was with the 101st Airborne. Okay. And he got wounded on that day. A couple of years back here, they had uh, an award for survivors of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I went to the Saratoga meeting with this presentation because I was one of those that was a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I, I met the uh, former Mayor Jones Fair and his wife was with him and we were talking over D-Day and in fact our first mission on D-Day was to go to St. Mary Glees where the 101st jumped in mm -hmm. circle at 2,000 feet for an hour or so before to draw fire so that those guys could get together on the ground and she was listening to that she shook my hand and said, well, thanks, because he got hit that day and he got evacuated back to England. What was, uh, as you were coming over the channel on your first mission in D-Day, what was your impression of the, what you were seeing below you? Yeah, actually, at the time, we are flying probably about, oh, 10,000 feet or less whole fighter group, first impression I got was Halifax bombers coming through from the other direction, right through our formation. Mm -hmm. They flew night missions and we we're going over there and getting there for daylight time. You couldn't see anything, you couldn't see a boat, you couldn't see nothing, it was not quite daylight time. Okay. We uh, had no navigation lights on, we were flying formation by the the exhaust cowl ring, we had to open our flaps part way uh, on the engine cooling mm -hmm. system 
and that is white hot constantly. Mm -hmm. And that's what we flew formation on. When we hit clouds, the uh, lead of the group had a definite heading that was given, he gave to the people that were on his wing, and they each picked up about five degrees off that and went up through the clouds and got together up on the top and went up over. But you couldn't see the, all the activity. It was too dark. Okay. After we circled uh, around St. Mary Glees, we had a secondary mission. We had 500 pounders on each one of our aircraft in the city of Carentan. Mm -hmm. That was the communications center for the Germans with all of their people mm -hmm. in southern France, well, not only southern France, in Normandy, and the Cherbourg Peninsula. That was their major headquarters. And after daylight came and we had circled there, our secondary mission was to dive bomb that communication center. We took it straight out. Hmm. A lot of ground fire? Were the Germans trying to protect it? That's as much ground fire as you had at each place that you went to, is how much they valued that target that you had. Mm -hmm. Whatever they could spare was put into the, uh, well, railroad roundhouses where they had to change and get supplies to their troops. They're, they were saddled with the tonnage that was able to get to their troops for being able to let them move, <coughs> move or not. Same as we were. Now, when did, um, when did you land in Normandy for the first time? D-Day plus six. Plus six. And that was on uh, Strip, Strip A-1. Yes, sir. Which is near... Point to Hawk. Point to Hawk. Uh, what was that? What was that like at D-Day plus six? Well, if you look at one of the little maps I got there, you'll see there's a little pencil line or a pen line about that long. And that's what we had. Plus just what the tanks uh, were around us and the infantry. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did the same things the infantry. We were uh, quartered in uh, pup tents in an apple orchard, mm. dug fox holes every night. They kept us away from the uh, landing strip. That's where the airplanes were. Mm -hmm. Spread them out, camouflaged them the best they could because the Germans would come through with JU-88s at night and bomb, but they were indiscriminate bomb. Yeah. There were no lights allowed, and they just hoped they'd get a target. You mm -hmm. know, they'd do strip bombing or something like that. Just aggravation. Now, the biggest problem we had there you had to remember that the Germans had everything they could muster to put right around there for the defense of that area. Mm -hmm. And the flak was horrendous hmm. when these ju 88 came over at night. You know, the Navy was shooting at them with their boats on, so we were shooting at them, the Army was shooting at them. Everybody that could shoot a gun practically would take a peck at them. And uh, the flak that came down, the flak bursts would open up, mm -hmm. and it's just like a grenade. The pieces would come down, and some of them were chunks. And we finally solved that problem by taking uh, what we had was a hard material. It was actually wrapped paper. Mm -hmm. It was a, a gas tank for our P-47. The first tanks that were issued were of this hard press board and it was lacquered up to the point it wasn't lacquered or something that was impervious to gasoline before. And we'd take some old tanks and cut them in half and put them over our sleeping bag. <laughs> and the next morning there were holes in the tent but there were no holes in you. That's interesting. It, interesting it was. <laughs> now, um your reason for being there, you were flying tactical missions? Directly in support of the tank, all of them. Mm -hmm. So you were basically on the deck? On the deck. We never, 
Well, actually, there were times when I had to fly through treetops because of the intensity of ACAC fire. Mm. And uh, you had the steel props at the time. It wasn't just the old wooden props. Mm -hmm. I don't say that you intentionally hit the tree, but you hit it. You come back with creases in your wings. But uh, if you think about it, the lower you go with an airplane, the shorter time period you're in view of somebody that's looking at you, okay. trying to shoot you down. And if there are two anti-aircraft units shooting at you, they would have at those three, four hundred miles an hour, they would only have one, two, three seconds. Mm -hmm. But they converged fire over different areas. And you had to fly through these or change direction in anticipation of where they were going to be shooting. Awful lot of concentration at this level. Concentration plus luck and a good guardian angel. I always say that I had a guardian angel that worked a hell of a lot of overtime. <laughs> it was uh, the guys you flew with, good group? I don't think anybody will ever answer that question any different than I am. If uh, you look at the awards and decorations that go with that group that are in that book over there, I've been to reunions oh, back since 1980s. I just went to St. Louis uh, a short time ago. We had a September. Mm -hmm. And I sat in one of the little uh, hospitality rooms one day after we were just getting ready to come back from St. Louis and I was talking to one guy and I said, you count the next 10 guys that come through that door and these are all pilots that I was talking about. The airmen were there too. There's no distinction there between one or the other. It's a group and that's the way they work. I said, you count the next 10 pilots that come through there and you'll find that there's been a thousand missions flown against the Nazis. Just 10. <laughs> the, um, so, your relationships with the ground crew, ground crew were fairly close? I've been in contact with Sergeant Derry, who was my crew chief, from the first time we went over in England. He just passed away a couple of years ago. I still am in contact with his wife. Yeah, from Fenton, Michigan. Hmm. Sergeant uh, Harry Hayes is up in uh, Black River, up in New York State. He's written a whole summary, a day-by-day -day diary hmm. that you should have. Now, do um, you think uh, you were closer to ground ground crews and other uh, like uh, escort I, I, pilots. Or? How can I say I I know? I was only with the 366. You know, it, it's just a comparison from what you've heard rather than experience. And what did you hear? Because uh, you're living in tents. Everybody's in everybody tents. Everybody's in tents. Uh, there was no distinction. It, it was just an organization, a military organization, and they all had the same job, same mission, from different approaches. Mm -hmm. Each one had a different approach, the communications man, the armament man, the mechanic, the pilot. It was just one bunch trying to survive. Was there uh, any particular mission or missions that stand out? For whatever reason? <laughs> you want to turn that off for a minute and I'll get you the uh, summary that was in the Troy record of one mission that's interesting. Well, but you can just tell us, as you recall it. <clears throat> that backs it up. Well, a lot of times people give you stories and they're just stories. I don't have to give you stories, I lived them. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll show you a copy of the Troy record at the time. We had uh, a mission in Belgium. Mm -hmm. 
I tracked it down to the 91st Bomb Group, the organization I'm going to be talking about. The uh, mission was uh, an escort and a target of opportunity mission. Mm -hmm. We had a thousand ton bomb under each wing. We ran our fuel range out, the 51s came in from East Anglia and they went on into Germany. They, went into, they were into the rural valley at the time, mm -hmm. the bombing. After our fuel range was down to a, a point that was predetermined by the mission, we had to go on our secondary mission, which was finding targets of opportunity. When we were fighting in Belgium, this is the time when the Germans were being pushed right back into Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, a. W. <coughs> Morgan the third, he was my wingman from Glensfall. He did. Yeah, we were just past the Low Countries in Belgium, and the canal system had canal locks with about a 40-foot head of water. If you're familiar with a 40-foot head of water, it will do downstream. It just by chance, I said, Bill, he says, there is our target. I said, let's take out that lock. Down below the lock was a whole bunch of barges. Wow. And this was German equipment going to around the Dunkirk area. Mm -hmm. And I said, take out those locks. I said, that water is going to tip them all the back. That's what happened. I took out the lower lock. He took out the upper lock. They had two locks on, two gates on mm -hmm. those locks, so that you could raise and lower the, mm -hmm. the barges. And we both pulled off. Our instructions were to cross the French coast. We were just opposite Dover, you know. Mm -hmm. I say opposite Dover, the, the cliffs of Dover, the long patch. But the channel is only about 20 or 25 miles wide uh, where we were. So we started back gathering altitude. We had seen while we were going up all of this stuff going down. So it went all the way into the low country. So it must have gone for 50 miles. Huh. It's just like taking out a dam, yeah. essentially what it was. Those barges were like jack straws. We had instructions to go across the coast heading back to England. At 10,000 feet, because that was uh, cutting out a lot of the ack ack from low altitude stuff. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, the bombers were on their way back, some of them, out of this 91st bomb group. I know because it had a, a big A on their tail, mm -hmm. a red background and an A. And uh, my flight leader at the time was Teddy Kerr. And he, he says, uh, I was the element leader, and he said, why don't you guys stay with that one that's only got one fan going? And he did, B-17, one, one outboard engine going, that was all. And outboard engine is bad on the B-17 because all your torque is mm -hmm. pulling, you know, the, the leverage is there. If you goose it to try to keep altitude, you, you're twisting yourself sideways and you can't hold it with a rudder. I know I've flown B-17. So we stayed, Bill Morgan and I stayed with this one B-17 that only had one engine going, and Teddy Kerr and Jay Phillips, they stayed with the other one. The other one finally landed along the French coast. He bellied in right along the French coast. He couldn't even make it across to England. Smoke coming out there. Well, the one that uh, Bill Morgan and I stayed with, Bill said about oh, 15 minutes later or so, he said, I can't stay here anymore. He said, my blinker light's going on my fuel. It was the end of our mission. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, go on this to Manston. I'll stay with these guys. So I did. I stayed with him. He went into Manston, which was a, a big uh, map. 
didn't only have runways with a big mat because mm -hmm. they would take all shot up B-17s and B-24s coming back from Germany. They had ambulances and they had air rescue and everything else. It's just on the coast in, uh, from London, right on the coast. So I stayed with the B-17 and he kept losing the altitude and I kept following him down and he's getting into the haze on the channel. There's always a haze on the channel because of the Arctic Ocean comes down through into the channel and the differences in air temperature, that's where you get your London fog. They, they were throwing everything out, they even dropped the belly turret out. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes, but nevertheless. When they hit the water, about halfway across the channel, I was just watching them go in. And the hydraulic effect, where that ball turret was out, behind the wing of the B-17, the hydraulic effect of the water, when he hit the water, just broke the airplane right in half. Mm. They were on low fuel at the time. It was the end of their mission, so there was a little flotation left in their wing tanks. Mm -hmm. So they stayed up maybe five minutes. Two dinghies came out of that. There was only five of them got out of it. Three in one and two in the other. I was circling them, and I had flipped up my IFF button, which was a signal to the English radar of who I was that they were talking to. You could identify the blip on the tube, with, on the cathode tube, to, with a, a bigger uh, blip to show that that was the airplane you were talking to. I explained to them what was happening. What I was explaining, the, the dinghy started to drift apart. I took a grease pencil and I wrote on a piece of a map, tie your dinghies together. I went down probably at about 50 feet over them and I had the British gauntlets at the time. Mm -hmm. They were leather, they were up to here. And they would float a little while in the water. I put the note in the glove and I went down and I threw it out over this one dinghy. And they, they paddled over to it. Of course, with a fighter, you could drop it out, and there was a short distance between where the glove hit and mm -hmm. where they were. Then they waved and tied their dinghies together. At, during this time period, Air Rescue out of Manston sent out a PT boat. And I was talking to them, and I told them I was low on fuel, and I said, when you can see me circling, you can go about 45 miles an hour. I said, when you can see me circling the P-47, that's where the guys are in the dinghies. I said, fire a green flare, and then I can take off and get to Manston. That's about how it evolved. Hmm. But the little part of the story that's cute is that I went into Manston, and as I landed, uh, they met my airplane, and he shot up. You. They wanted to know if I was battle damaged. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I just need fuel. Oh, go over there. <laughs> I just needed fuel. <laughs> I sat there maybe for an hour, and uh, I asked the tower to call my home base to where I was mm -hmm. so they wouldn't have me listed missing in action. And uh, they finally gave me permission to take off to get back to my home base when things settled down between flights of the bombers. I started down the taxiway and the little jeep come out and the guy was going, oh, hey, wait, 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 you know. I couldn't hear him when the engine was running out of taxi. And uh, I stopped because with that P-47 prop, you had 15-foot props. And I, I didn't turn the engine off and the guy came around the back of the wing jumped up on it and he gave me my glove bag with a bottle of scotch. <laughs> they had time in that hour wait that I had to get back. And uh, I've been trying ever since to find out what the names of those guys were, but I haven't been able to do it, except that I did know it was a 91st bomb group. Hmm. I got their book and uh, it had all of the airplanes that were shot down, but they didn't give names of the crew, you know, just... So I could never 
associated. I went uh, through quite a bit of, of trouble to try to find out through the years, but I've never been able to succeed. Now, that's that part of the story. The next part of it is, I got back to my base at Thruxton, debriefing happened after, right after you landed. The comment after I, I got talking to the intelligence officer, I was a second lieutenant at that time. He says, uh, you know, he says, you guys ought to get back here sooner so I can get my report in quicker. He wasn't worried about me or what I had done or anything else. He just wanted to get his lousy report in, and that was the comment of the day for me. <laughs> Does that make up a little story for you? Yeah, that's a good story. Yeah. So you did how many missions? 99. 99. What was the last mission? Jeez. To separate about 99 missions. I think. Uh, you into Germany? You're into Germany at that point? No, no. Uh, Drew, Leon, France, Reims, Reims was my last mission. And with us, it was working the same things we were doing on the beachheads, mm -hmm. going into a, uh, a geo-rough position where the tanks had reported they were, and looking for German activity ahead of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my orders actually the oh, end of October. I got I got orders in there to say mm -hmm. cover up what I'm saying. Twenty eighth of October I had to go from Reims into uh, Lu uh, Bel Luxembourg, the northern tip of Luxembourg, which is just uh, south of Bastogne. And they said, well, you know how to coordinate this air activity. Go show the 9th Armored Division how to do it. And I have my orders to go home. But I had two weeks to go up there and show them how to do it. So you knew it was going to be your last mission? I didn't. No, you did. Okay. Maybe that was a good thing. Uh, that wasn't the mission itself. But okay. that was part of the ground activity that I was tied into. The mission that we had was looking for German okay. activity and dive bombing any targets they had for us. But at that time, your weather was breaking down in October and November. Right. A lot of people in tanks and infantry you speak to, they say, well, those fly boys, they just fly when the weather's nice, you know. But they didn't know that maybe 100 miles to the side, we took out an ammunition dump where we could see the ground. And a hundred miles that side, we shot up a whole bunch of tanks. So you weren't just sitting there waiting for the weather to clear? No. Yeah. So you went home uh, in 40... 44. So you missed the bulge for the most part? Like a week and a half. The 16th of December was a bad little bulge, and I came back on the 28th of October, or November. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in northern... Luxembourg, in a little town of Ulflegen. Uh, the uh, time period is in my mind because I met the daughter of one of our pilots that was shot down in uh, Belgium. Mm. Just the time that I was with the 9th Armored Division. The 9th Armored Division took the bridge at Remagen, which mm -hmm. was the only bridge that was open. And Joe Early was a man that checked me out in P-47s in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And that's the day he got shot down. Mm -hmm. His daughter was two years old, and I met her at uh, one of our uh, reunions, mm -hmm. and I gave her a copy of the checkout sheet that her father signed, and it's the only signature in writing that she had of her father. And she uh, lives in Kansas City right now, mm -hmm. and she wanted me to go last uh, summer 
to go over to Belgium with her because the little town is named of Gouvy, G-O-V-I-V-Y. They're putting up a plaque for him. Mm. You know, it, it's one of those things of recognition that the foreign countries have to the planet. And they knew it was his airplane because just like they identify any air, fighter airplanes, they get the numbers on the guns and they get different parts mm. numerically registered for each aircraft. I flew the same airplane through all the missions. Really? Now, why did you get to, did you have X number of missions you, you had to fly and that's why they, you were able to get out the, of it? Early in the war, the bomber people, they would come back with 25 missions. And then the fighters got 25 missions in three times faster than the, the heavies. So they said, well, let, let's go to 50 missions. So they went to 50 missions and then went in over on the beachhead and they said, well, we still need you guys. So we went to 75. And then there was a point system that was developed. I can see you know more than you're saying to me when you say, yeah, right, you know what the point system was. They added up uh, how much time you had at the front lines. They, and added up points for decorations and this and that. This was about 1945. It was 1945 because I was uh, I was teaching Chinese pilots how to play instruments at Marana, Arizona, at the time. And the first sergeant came in. I was an instructor there, and he said, Sir, he said, when do you want to go home? I said, yesterday. <laughs> and he says, well, if you want to go, he says, you got more points than anybody on the base. He says, we can have your orders cut by Tuesday. So that's the time period when it struck home to me that I had made it, you know. Mm. I had a, a Dodge, a club coupe, and I had been riding Harleys before I went into service, and I was acquainted with the Harley dealer downtown. And I said, uh, he said, uh, you want to sell that car? Cars were hard to come by in those times, and the tires on it were getting so thin, I couldn't drive from there back to the East Coast. And I said, yeah, you got any motorcycle? He said, I got a motorcycle that was refused by the police department, an overhead 61. How are we swapping? He says, I'll swap you even. I said, you're on, because it had brand new tires. My wife and I come back from there to the East Coast and I'm <laughs> So you would married in the meantime? I married a month before I went overseas. Oh, okay. Thanksgiving Day, 1943, and I went overseas the next month. And when you came in back, December. She, and when you came back, she she went out with you. Yes, and uh, you know you're only talking about the first third of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I came out and went to civilian life. I worked for the uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. I had a district office account, mm -hmm. just servicing clean. And uh, we had two children. I had an adopted boy from Canada, a little orphan from mm -hmm. Canada. And I had a little daughter, six months old, and they called me back in as a reserve officer. And that's when I started go the other direction. The second career. Well, we're probably going to have to get that on another taping. You don't need to. You, well, no, if you want to read about it, I got it all. Right. Um, I think we've just come to the end of the time. This oh. we, we could have gone on for another hour or so. We, oh, yeah. We've got a few more minutes if you oh, yes, yes, let's can do get that. him to uh, display those. Yeah. If you can just hold this up and give us an idea of what the various metals are. Oh, yeah, I guess it's situated here. This is a composite of 
what a lot of the servicemen do when they come back from overseas mm -hmm. with any decorations and so on they have. This is the uh, miniatures that you have to wear on your mess dress. Okay. I just put them in there, but it's not that many more than these. Mm -hmm. These are the, the decorations and awards. I retired as a lieutenant colonel, started in the Army Air Corps, wound up as a fighter pilot in the 9th Air Force, Distinguished Flying Cross. This is New York State Conspicuous Service Cross. And Reserve Medal, Air Medal with 17 clusters on it, which means instead of giving you another medal, you put a little bronze indicator on it. Mm -hmm. After you have five bronze ones you put in, uh, you, you take those off the air metal ribbon, you put a silver one. So I got three silver ones and a couple more bronze ones. You're a busy fellow. Yeah. That's great. And this is from the Korea. <coughs> Excuse me. This is from the uh, United Nations, mm -hmm. which was the Korean War time period. And this was Korean Defense. Air Force Commendation Medal. Mm -hmm. This was the first Captain Barge, as I explained to you before, a friend of mine in Australia. When I made Captain, he took an Australian corn and filed him out and sent him <laughs> to me from Australia. And you wore those? Uh, yes, I wore them. Yeah, they really, we just wore them on our collars then. Right. But, uh, on your dress uniforms, you wore them on the shoulder. Well, thank you. Do you want to? Get oh, a shot of yeah, uh, let's get a Larry and his son. You said you wanted pictures, so I brought a couple. <laughs> there you go. And that's your son? That's my son, Craig. My youngest son. He's uh, in the Marines. He's got a total now Something like 12, 13 years in the Marines. Uh -huh. He's been with the helicopters out of Norfolk. Mm -hmm. He just came back uh, last month from Kosovo. And he wanted a father and son picture taken. So we went down. Actually, I can still get my uniform. I was just going to say, you still got your uniform. That, that's a pretty neat trick. You have to, to get buried in. <laughs> One way of looking at it. Isn't it? It's ironic, but true. <laughs> well, thank you very much. All right, sir. Wait, wait a minute. This, oh, I'm sorry. Just keep it this way. I okay. Just, I just had it tacked in there. Okay. Okay, thank you.